Welcome to the Classy Thursday edition of the St. Mark Spark. I'm thrilled that you are able to join us this afternoon. As we begin our time together, let's say a word of prayer. Lord, we pray for your creation. We pray for uh, all those who are uh, seeking answers this afternoon, all those who are working for peace, uh, all those, God, who uh, need and long for your presence to be close right now. Uh, be with us in this time. Be with us in this day. Uh, help us, God, to follow. It's in your name we do pray, and all God's children said, Amen. So we're going to jump right into our scripture reading today. It is from the Daily Lectionary. It's from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. Now, by this point in Jesus' ministry, he is beginning to get a little bit of a reputation. He is, starts off uh, with the baptism, and then he goes into the wilderness for temptation. He calls his disciples. He's been doing some things out with some different uh, areas of, of uh, Israel. And then he goes home. And this is the story of Jesus coming home. And it's not the, the homecoming maybe that we would expect for him. Then Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, returned to Galilee. And a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. That was the custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and then Jesus sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me the proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you have done at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut three years and six months, and there was a severe famine throughout all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed except for Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, so that they may, might hurl him off of the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thomas Wolfe famously said, you can never go home. Again, I was thinking a little bit about uh, the gentle giant Don Williams in his song, Good Old Boys Like Me. And, and in that song about the question of whether you can go home again, he talks about Thomas Wolfe whispering in his head. That question of, can we ever truly go home again? Now, Nazareth is not the town that Jesus was born in. It's not the place he lived first. He was born, we're told, in Bethlehem. We're told then the family went down to Egypt for some time until it was safe again and they came back to Nazareth and Nazareth was the boonies Nazareth was seen by many people as a backward place the question was even asked can anything good come out of Nazareth it's interesting when Jesus begins his public ministry he doesn't start off in his hometown instead after uh, going to John after being baptized after going for the, the time of testing and getting his, getting his disciples He goes to other places to do healing to do miracles to do, to do teachings And so he comes home in today's story And he's in the synagogue as is his custom on the Sabbath The hand on the scroll of Isaiah and he goes through it to get to this part and it's a beautiful passage 
It's a beautiful passage. I'm just going to read it again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has appointed, anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is a pretty good thing. Jesus reads all this. He sits down. You could hear a pin drop in their every eye, the scripture says, says that every eye in the synagogue is on Jesus. And then Jesus drops the mic. Jesus says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today you are seeing the person who embodies this, who embodies the person who's going to bring good news to the poor, who's going to set the captives free, who's going to give sight to the blind, who's going to release captive and proclaim the, the year, proclaim uh, the year of the Lord's favor. This is incredible what Jesus is doing because they see Jesus as a novelty. They see Jesus as, as a person who does miracles and does these other kinds of signs. And Jesus says in front of them, I'm all that and so much more. I'm all that and so much more. Now, people were fine with it at first, I guess. They began to say, uh, uh, this is great. And then you hear that, isn't this Joseph's son? This is one of us. Even the people of Nazareth who are saying, who other people look down upon are looking down upon themselves and say, oh, this is Joseph's kid. This is the carpenter's boy. Who does he think he is? Who does he think he is reading the scroll and then saying it's about me? Today in your hearing, this is fulfilled. So they take offense at Jesus. They're bothered by Jesus. They're upset with Jesus. And then Jesus says to them, he doubles down. He says, good stuff doesn't happen in prophets' hometown because people don't accept prophets. It's because the prophets have left, but also because the people have remained the same. Their attitudes have remained the same. Their prejudices, their biases have remained the same. And he says it's the same thing. It's nothing new in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, the story about Elijah. There's this famine, but it was a widow at Zarephath in Sidon, an outsider who re received the food, who Elijah went to. In the time of Elijah, that there was uh, leper, leprosy, but it was only Naaman, the Syrian, who Elijah went in and helped. And Jesus is basically saying, it's like, if the insiders don't get me, well, the outsiders will. Now, this is a powerful thing, and they are upset. They're upset, I think, at Jesus' words, because they are harsh. But they're also upset, I think, because one of them is doing something good. One of them is doing something special. There's a story, I guess, in the mid-Atlantic states, a story about crab buckets. And I've never seen this, but uh, someone who is a visitor, let's say from St. Louis, from Missouri, goes out there and he, and he sees the novelty of crab buckets. You know, in crab buckets, one of the things about them, these barrels, is that there are a lot of crabs in there, but there's no, there's no uh, seal on it. There's no uh, lid on it. And the person, say from Missouri, comes and asks the crab or asks the merchant, says, "Your crabs are all going to get away. Why do you have? Why don't you have a lid on there?" And the crabber says to this visitor, "He said, just watch for a while." And so the visitor, the stranger, watches and he sees that every time a crab tries to get out, every try, time a crab tries to ascend, the other crabs start grabbing them and start pulling them back down and so the fact is that nobody can escape because the people or the crabs won't let them well this is the story it's a truism in life about sometimes uh if someone's trying to make something better something more godly something that uh brings honor to god or the, improve themselves there are those other crabs that are pulling them back down there are those other people who are trying to bring that person back down I mentioned that Jesus, uh, first thing he does after he's baptized and there's temptation is he gets disciples. What's interesting, when Jesus calls disciples, he says, come and follow me. Jesus' command is always to come. Come and see. Come and experience. Come and be changed by your time with me. Perhaps the biggest hurdle in Nazareth is Jesus' call to come and be changed. Come and follow. Come and see what God is doing. We'd rather stay. The people in Nazareth would rather stay the same. Frankly, we would rather stay the same. It's our biggest hurdle 
today. The call for Jesus is to come and follow, not to stay and be the same. Finally, uh, one of my favorite quotes from Mark Twain is this, travel is fatal to prejudice. Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. Saying simply that to travel is to be changed. To travel is to encounter people who are broken, people who vote differently than you, people who sin differently than you. But to travel in the world is to see people as broken, to see people uh, as loved. To travel in the world is to start seeing other people in what they need. To stay means it's the same old perceptions. To travel is to change. And Jesus calls always to come and to follow. To move beyond a provincial worldview. To move beyond a small spiritual life. The call always from Jesus in his hometown and other places is to come to follow and to be changed. Now this is true for us today in the church. This is true for us in our world. It's true for us in how we live our lives. To follow Jesus, to hear that call, to come and follow, and then to be changed. And then in that changing, to be the change. May God be with you this day. May God be with you this, uh, this week, this weekend, as we get ready for a congregational meeting for the election of officers on Sunday, for a, uh, a special uh, picnic for youth, for children and their families at Susan Park, and also for uh, a, a food drive that's going on at church. A lot of stuff come up here this Sunday at St. Mark, and hope that you are able to participate. You are certainly welcome to do so. May God be with you all.